Greetings, everyone. This is a interview conversation between myself and my newly met friend, Joseph Gregory Hallett, or Greg, as he likes to be known, I assume. Um, this, is a, uh, this is a presentation of the Gemstone Global Media. And um, this is the first time I've met Greg in person or by electronic means. I've been studying his work for several years, and I find it quite extraordinary. And it has assisted me in my life path of uh, integrating what I call the sweep of history and the fabric of history. The fabric as in many woven threads of parallel and intersecting and bisecting uh, timelines and events and so forth, um, most of which is hidden. And we're going to be talking about hidden history here, hidden for most people. Uh, we'll start on the premise that for most people in this world, everything you think is real is a lie. And uh, the history we're going to talk about is revealing the truth. Primarily, initially, talking about such things as bloodlines, monarchies, uh, thrones, crowns, and things like that. Things that I've studied myself for 40 to 50 years. And when I encountered Greg's work, uh, it opened up a tremendous field of, uh, of elements that I knew were there. I just didn't know all the detail. So to begin, Greg and his co-author, uh, Francisco Manuel, or the British exilarch Francisco Manuel, and Joseph Gregory uh, Hallett, co-authored this book, if we can get it without the flat and the light. It's called The Hidden King of England, Arma Christi. It's a five volume set and it has a big image there, a signet, which Greg will tell us a little bit of what that is. And to summarize, basically, it is the hidden history, especially of the last 200 years of what has really happened with the bloodlines that have taken control of the British monarchy, the British crown, the throne, uh, the current sitting monarch, Queen Elizabeth II, who she really is in terms of her family line, who she isn't in terms of her family line, and things like that. So, Greg, would you like to start with anything in that context? Um, well, let me say this before you do, that there are many uh, resources of Greg's work. Uh, this book, this five-volume set, is absolutely a must for anybody who would like to know the true history of the world that we live in and what affects our law and our money systems and things like that. Um, but you've done many interviews over the years and you've told a lot of the detail of the story. So I don't wanna spend a lot of time in all of that. We can refer people to those interviews because, in, because I have a very wide and deep uh, study of all of these kind of subjects, there are things that I would like to go deeper, not repeat the same content, the same interviews you've done before. I'd like to go deeper and ask some questions and see where we go in the conversation and see if we can bring more of the hidden out to be revealed. So with that, Greg, um, Let's, let's I have begin. to live up to my own reputation now. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, yes, right. Okay, I haven't done an interview for a year, for 12 months. Last one was 9th of November 2017. Um, and various things have happened which indicate that what I've been saying is absolutely true, the truth right on the button and touching a nerve. So I did my last interview on the Thunder Oak where Tropical Storm Greg came from Mexico and followed the path of Tropical Storm John and then jumped to where I am in Dis. And it was, it was, a, it was an out-of-this-world supernatural storm. It was like 200% moisture from ground all the way up, no lightning, but thunder. And it was just moving and it moved towards my profile oak tree that I was photographed in front of. 
And that oak tree is exactly 777 meters from where I am now, where I sit and work. And 777 is the number of the end times, the times of the end, and the shin, which is the forbidden secret. And I've been running the shin, the forbidden secret, since 2010, and possibly well before. And I was chosen to represent the end times with my co-author, Francisco Manuel, and then I represented the new age. The last time that happened was a couple of thousand years ago. So the, the, the storm, tropical storm Greg, jumped from Mexico, and Mexico um, X means the true king of England. That's what it's code for. So if you loop Mexico, it reads, me, true king of England, I come. Me, true king of England, I come. You understand? Sure, of course. Um, so, um, and then in the last page of Revelation in the Bible, it, it says, I will come quickly. And it mentions the word come five or six times in the last page, if you include the last paragraph of the previous page, it's, it's five or six times. So it absolutely came quickly and it split the, the thunder not lightning, there's no lightning strike on the oak tree. It split the thunderbolt, not lightning, thunderbolt sound, split a third of the oak tree off, which also fulfills the, the Bible prophecy. And then what it revealed when the bit that fell down was Anubis, right? A clear life size Anubis who's seven foot 11. And, um, so I photographed it, and then it said, in a, um, in a frozen sea green lake, which was the ground frozen green, and then it should be surrounded by a crown of gold, and when the tree fell down and started to die, it turned autumn at the same time as autumn, and produced a crown, which is very close to Queen Victoria's ruby coronet. And then it said an 80-year-old guy with an axe would be there with hail and incense. So I went back to the tree and there's an 80-year-old guy there with a chainsaw, which is a powerful axe, yeah? Mm -hmm. And he was cutting up the tree and burning bits of it, which was smoke. And there's hail coming down, but it was more like sleet. Right? But it was just so close. Mm -hmm. So what I, what I realized is that the whole world was run on predictions. And um, we are incredibly attuned to predictions and are always trying to predict things. And um, when you have two things, you think there's a, a different methods of prediction, different works. Like there's the tradition received, there's the Bible, especially Revelations, and a bit of Daniel, and there's... Um, uh, the book of predictions and the, the Rosicrucian cosmography. Um, and when a prediction is happening, uh, it takes precedence over everything else. Everyone, all the other orders, so they just step aside. And um, according to the Bible, you need two predictions to make the claim. And I've fulfilled virtually all of Revelations. I could go through it for about eight hours and show the images and, and exactly what's happened, you know, and say, here it is. And the early Christian science, the oldest Christian science is something called typology theology, which is the transplanting of events that happened then into a new location, right? <laughs> right? So they'll have, say, the Sea of Galilee, and here's a copy of the Sea of Galilee. C is S-E-A, but it's also the letter, it's completely homophonous with the letter C, which is the Roman numeral for 100, mm -hmm. right? So when it transposes the Sea of Galilee, it's going to be in a body of water that's 100 times bigger or 100 times smaller. And in the fulfillment of the predictions, it was 100 times smaller, right? And... They, what's happening with the fulfillment of predictions is they're bringing, they're bringing things from all over the place, including buildings, um, built forms, steelies, like, which is generally a bit of 
stone about this big, about this high, with lettering on it in a town. They record some events. But um, what I've found is the stele is absolutely magnificently codified and predictive. Predictive. So what I've been doing is recording the predictions. And the last interview I gave on 9-11-2017, almost a year ago, that touched a nerve. So after that, I got a flu and my IQ went down to about 5%. Hmm. For till, till about March. And I could only remember my name. I couldn't remember anyone else's name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and so by sort of April, I could work one day a week, focus one day a week. And then by June, I could sort of manage about every second day. And then on the 2nd of June, my publisher uh, and webmaster was killed. She mm. was about 500 miles from me in the Black Forest. And she was killed on Coronation Day at the hour of coronation while selling a book called The Hidden King of England, mm. which tends to point towards Prince Chuck. Mm. Yeah. Um, so what happens with, the, uh, with assassinations is that they, this, the assassins tend to codify their assassination, which is their work, they tend to codify their assassination onto the person who hired them. Right? So in this way, say, she was selling five volumes called The Hidden King of England, and she died on, uh, in German time, 1.30 p.m., which is 12.30 p.m. here, uh, on the 2nd of June, 2000. And 18, which is exactly 65 years after coronation day and 65 means macrocosm microcosm so it's a very important number and on important dates they try and do um, events that mark the event yep. mm -hmm. so uh, and at the same time I was really sick with the same illness that she had but I survived it you know, so 500 miles apart, no communication. She's totally sick. I'm totally sick. She dies. I don't. Then they, um, that was the 2nd of June. Then all communication with that office stopped on the 14th of June. Then by the 31st of August, they had stolen 400,000 pounds. That's retail value of my books. Hmm. as well as my four backup hard drives. My previous other backup hard drive had been stolen by a, um, a Windsor in 2015. And then and in between those dates, on the 13th of July, they closed down my three websites. Yeah, and they took, took your books off of Amazon and other resources. Um, well, they... They've, they've done the damage as much as they could. Like I tried to get my website in my name, get my websites in my name and transferred to me. And they wouldn't allow it. And then, um, yeah, so basically I, I got nearly killed. My webmaster publisher got killed and all my websites got closed down and all my books got stolen and all my hard drives got stolen, which is back after my last... 20 years work. Hmm. Not only that, I was sick for about five months mm -hmm. and I could only just remember my name. So I probably touched a nerve. You think? <laughs> you think? Yeah. yeah. And the nerve I touched was that tropical storm Greg left Mexico. Mexico means me, true King of England. I come the tropical storm Greg came out of Mexico jumped to disc, split the profile oak tree, my profile oak tree, exactly 777 meters from me, which means the shin, the end time, the end of times, and uh, produced Anubis. And then the Egyptian trinity, and the, which the Christian trinity came out of, there are no images of Joseph in the Christian trinity. 
and Joseph is Anubis in the Christian Egyptian Trinity. So when they revealed Anubis, they were saying that I was Joseph, right? And in saying that I was Joseph, they were confirming all of my claims in all of my videos saying that I am the head of the house of Joseph, which is the highest house. Mm -hmm. It's like the house of the father. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they're not denying it anymore. And the Anubis connection is to do with the Heb Seb festival, which was given to the pharaohs. And the pharaoh means, they were never called pharaohs. Pharaoh means ruler. It was the Greeks that applied the name pharaoh, which came from a ceremony in a, in a Pari temple. But they were always just the ruler. And what they would do to reinvigorate their rule was to do the Heb Sed festival, which was run around a rectangle, four stones. And then people in the, in the town or city would be all around just cheering vigorously and then be put into a cave-like situation and uh, take some drug or don't take some drug, get administered something by the priest and then um, have an out of body experience and then collect some uh, knowledge which would be beneficial to civilization. Uh, and that was the Heb Sed Festival. So they put on a Heb Sed Festival for me, 1970 to 1980. And that's how I learned some of the tricks. Mm -hmm. right. And then they put on another Heb Sed Festival for me in June 2014 possibly going to September 2014. So um, that leads to some really deep stuff. And what happened with the first Heb Sed Festival, which I passed, which is rare, it's very rare to pass a, 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 a raw Heb Sed Festival. It's a raw initiation and it does involve out of body, but it's not out of body experience. It's you get forced out of your body. Um, they try to kill your body while you're out of your body you got to jump back in your body, save your body. You do that three times in about five minutes. And during that time of terror fear, you get all the downloads you need to alter civilization for the rest of your lifetime. Hmm. That's actually how it works, right? And, you know, I don't tell. Afterwards, I called an ambulance. <clears throat> and the ambulance driver wouldn't come closer than 20 yards from me because I was... So um, electrified, if you like. Mm -hmm. yeah. Glowing. Um, um? Glowing. Well, I wouldn't say I would. I wouldn't say it was bliss. <laughs> it was. Well, terrifying. I didn't say bliss. I just said glowing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. A strong um, electromagnetic field. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Huge, huge. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, so they put on another one in. Uh, 14th of June, 2014, just before the start of the end times, they announced that I was dead. And I didn't actually get to see that until the 19th of June, five days later, which is the time of a Heb Sed festival. It's usually five days. And um, so I, I was actually living, I'd finished all my books, ran out of money. I was doing what I always wanted to do, which was live in a cave in Europe. And I was living with this cave right by the sea which was actually the predicted cave. It was actually absolutely predicted that I would be there at that time. So I was in the cave, no electricity. And five days later, I'm announced, I'm announced dead. Five days later, I go to a friend's place, said, can I, you know, turn my computer on? So I get these emails. And so we're sitting around. And uh, then I get all the web messages that I'm announced dead, you know, which was the second Heb Sed Festival. And it's quite rare to have two Hebsed festivals. They're usually given to a ruler who's, who's ruled for 30 years. He has a Hebsed festival. So uh, my first Hebsed festival was 1980 and 34 years later was 2014, second Hebsed festival. And it's just, um, um, well, I'll tell you what, it's, it just means that when there's codes to be broken, I can break the codes. I just see them straight away. Mm -hmm. 
I'd like to stop you there and kind of back up and fill in a little bit. Yeah. And ask a couple of my questions that I have had. Um, just for people who are watching who don't have the context, aren't familiar with your work or who Francisco Manuel is and all of that, um, the, uh, the context of that, you've used some terms like the shin that yeah. you talk about in the book and yeah. that is defined as a specific period from 1812 to 2012 uh, yeah. Yeah. that things were basically hidden and underground that things had to be fulfilled and so forth. And Francisco is, is the lineal descendant and heir from a specific man um, and uh, um, who was the uh, legitimately born son of Victoria and George V uh, in 1834. So I have a question here because you're referring to you, who you are and in relationship to um, your position. But it's my understanding from reading the book that basically the, the hidden king with that lineal descent is actually Francisco. So can you explain, maybe give a little context of, uh, of, of that lineage, what happened in 1834, and then what is your relationship to, uh, to the bloodline or the relationship with Francisco, his position, versus how you're describing your position? Okay, I can do that. Um, I've got Anubis behind me in the wood. So at the end, I'll, if we get round to it, I'll show you. So just so you know that the story that I just told you was concrete. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the Shin was, was, came from a, a dream by Amschel Mayer Rothschild in 1773. And he had a dream um, that he was going to breed into the Sangreal lineage, the blood royal lineage. And that would be from the time of his death for 200 years. So he died in 1812. And in 1870, the Rothschilds purchased the rights to the, um, uh, the, the overture, the 1812 overture which was actually 1870, mm -hmm. to, to mark the death of Maya Amschel Rothschild, who was a psychic. He was very known to be very psychic. So, and, and these, these psychics deal with predictions. So he put this prediction, the 1773 prediction, and it's in the RAT archives, which is the Royal Archives Trust, uh, which is held in the British Museum. So you can possibly look it up. So in 1815, the Rothschilds um, had or wanted to have the Central Bank of England. So they funded Napoleon and they funded Wellington, the Duke of Wellington, in the Battle of Waterloo to be in June 1815. But to get the message of who won the Battle of Waterloo back to London quicker than the Pony Express, the Rothschilds um, got the carrier pigeons and started breeding the homing pigeon in 1814, right? And where they trained the new homing pigeon in 1814 to fly back to Bank in London was one kilometre away from Waterloo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> How convenient. Mm -hmm. So... Um, the Battle of Waterloo was due to start at four in the morning at nautical twilight, nautical dawn. That was normal. But it was rainy a bit and the French so supposedly complained that they couldn't move their cannon and gun carriages, uh, the wheels of them, because it was too wet in the mud. So the battle actually started at midday. Instead of going from four for eight hours till midday. It started at midday and went for eight hours and stopped just before eight o'clock at night. So that would mean that the Pony Express was riding for a couple of hours and then it got dark. So the horse would be slower. 
and then they'd catch the boat across to Folkestone and then get up to London and they were getting hassled by Rothschild agents all the way up, like maiming the horse, etc. cetera. Mm. Well, the Rothschilds did was they had their homing pigeons and they had two baskets and they had um, males with their female breeding partner waiting in bank in London. And they had the contrary message on the pigeon in case one got lost. So the message would be um, Wellington won. So if Napoleon won, they'd lift up the hatch for Wellington won and they'd fly back. And if Wellington won, which he did, they lifted up the hatch for Napoleon won, message on the leg of the pigeon, homing pigeon, was Napoleon won. And that flew back to bank in two hours, 40 minutes. So if it, when they were let out at 8 p.m., they got to bank at two hours, 40 minutes, uh, which is 10.40. And at 10.43, the astronomical twilight ended. So it was too dark for the pigeons to see. So the whole thing was exquisitely timed. So what Nathan Mayer Rothschild did, did then is he got, um, he read the message from the pigeon and it said, Napoleon has won. So he goes down to the commodity burst, which is the stock exchange, and he says, Napoleon has won. Mm-hmm. And all the British, including the British royal family, they just cashed in their shares and got whatever they could for them, which was pennies on the dollar, or pence on the pound. And then the lame Pony Express horse rider comes in a day and a half later and uh, he says, um, Wellington won. Meanwhile, Nathan May Rothschild had got his agents to buy up all of the um, uh, commodity burst shares backing the Duke of Wellington. So when the real news came in, Nathan May Rothschild had made such a large amount of money that he's never declared it. The Rothschild family never declared how much they made. But it bankrupted the British royal family. And the Rothschilds now had the breeding rights to the British royal family. And they took control of the Bank of England. Mm. Yeah. And previously, the Bank of England, up until about 1837, the biggest depositor of the Bank of England, in the Bank of England and the Bank of Scotland, was Lord Mugardo, Carvalhiel and the Carvalhiels owned Carvalhiel, the palace of Carvalhiel, which is also Stoy Palace, which means Easter and Resurrection. And that was where the predictions of me were made. And the, the, the Hep Said Festival that I just told you about is actually codified in the Colonnade Cross at Stoy Palace. So it gets really deep and then I have graphics to help people understand it, you know. But yeah, so um, so the world, world's run on predictions and there's often contrary predictions happening and you often get, um, so let's say the Rothschilds taking over the British royal family um, and then there's predictions how that family will be revived and who will do it, right? Who will break the code? Who will, who will write the book? And it said um, the tradition of Steve prediction was that it would be someone from Lemuria, which is New Zealand, Australia, and Papua New Guinea. And um, the way they, they um, described it, um, the way they defined which of those countries it was, was through the royal style and titles but queen elizabeth ii not really the queen let's call her elizabeth ii she had her own part in it and was absolutely going out of her way to name me as the person who would fulfill the predictions including putting my name on the coins and taking her image off the coins Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, so um, yeah, yeah. So what happened then is that the the, um, uh, the British, the the Rothschilds had the breeding rights to the British royal family, so they bred with 
Princess Victoire Louise, and they um, gave Queen Victoria scopolamine, which is a date rape drug. Prince Albert, who died a virgin and was in a bigamous marriage, he held a hand while she was given scopolamine, which completely relaxes your muscles, but makes you aware of what's happening. And that produced seven, uh, nine Batard royal, uh, flat lie royal family children, um, who are Queen Victoria's nine official children. They're all Rothschild bastards. Right. So just and to fill in, so, so the audience who hasn't read any of the books, a um, couple of key pieces. So Nathan Rothschild, who was a patriarch after his father died in 1812, um, he fathered Queen Victoria's mother, uh, Victoria, Victoria Louise. And he, then well, he, 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 Nathan Mayer Rothschild was the oldest son, and the youngest son was um, Baron Jacob Mayer de Rothschild, the French Baron Rothschild. And they had a what's called uh, in royal circles, it's called a Merovingian bestia Neptune procreation tradition, <laughs> which mm -hmm. the French, French call a threesome or a menace <laughs> We would call it a threesome. Mm -hmm. And the, the seed that took hold was the French Baron Jacob Mayer de Rothschild. Mm. So, um, so that produced Queen Victoria. Right. Um, and the Duke of Wellington told, revealed to Princess Victoria the secret when she was about 10 years old uh, by opening up the door and showing her mother, Princess Victoire Louise, in a sexual act with her secretary. Um, so... Um, Queen Victoria then secretly married the second in line to the throne, who was blind Prince George of Cumberland. And he um, got Victoria, uh, yeah, got Princess Victoria pregnant, they were both 14. And then they married in, on British Mother's Day. France didn't have a Mother's Day at the time in Mont Saint-Michel, which is Normandy, which is, um, or Brittany, it's on the border. And Brittany is called Brittany because a comet hit Britain in about 555 AD to 562 AD for that seven year period. The whole of Britain turned yellow so everyone in Britain left and went to Northwest France, which was then called Brittany. Mm -hmm. So in some ways they did actually marry in Britain. And then to confirm that's Britain, they started up um, Arc Manche, which is where France owns Southeast England and controls Southeast England and Britain, England, UK controls Northwest France and polices it a bit. So, France ended up owning the Elizabeth II bridge and then gave it to China, which is a strategic asset. Uh, um, strategic asset. So, um, so Queen Victoria got married to the second in line to the throne. Princess Victoria got married to the second in line to the throne and that legitimised herself and it legitimised her son who was born seven weeks later and that was prince marcos manuel and that was the only true lineage thereafter of the british royal family right <clears throat> um so because possibly because of the hib said festival um you know the high orders absolutely knew who i was because what happened in 90, 1980 was it's called the event you know and it's very rare to pass the event so um, I was called up to decipher the royal marks that Queen Victoria left her son, Prince Marcos Manuel, when he was 16 in 1850. And um, so we did that, and that's largely in volume one and volume two of The Hidden King of England. And that right. Right. told story. Um, and then, you know, 
Queen Elizabeth has been notifying the world of um, who's actually the king. Um, so what she did in 19, 1967 is um, I was introduced to um, King George the Sixth son. Officially, he doesn't have a son. He's got two daughters, Elizabeth and Margaret. But George the Sixth didn't sire Elizabeth or Margaret. And uh, George Fitzradima that I met in New Zealand was Kingy George the Seventh. And when I met him, they changed the New Zealand currency from British pounds and pence to New Zealand dollars and cents. So that's a mark. That's a, a huge mark because it's currency and one of the coins is a crown, you know, and they retained the British crown in New Zealand. So it was kind of usable for another, to about 1971. Um, so, uh, and then that was 1967 and then 1968, the Rothschilds or the Royal Mint or Queen Elizabeth herself started to put my name on the coins in, um, on the 25th of April, 1968 on the 5p coin. The coin started to read Elizabeth II Greg, <laughs> which is very nice of her. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, on the coins, um, they're, they're written in all caps, right? All, and all caps letters have to be written, have to be read as though they're in ancient Latin. Well, they are in ancient Latin. So then when you read them as um, how they appear to be in English, it reads Elizabeth to Greg Hallett Ibis. And the tradition received is the king is delivered by the Ibis. Right? And in the name Elizabeth is Hallett. Um, and what's left, left over is I-B-E-Z. And the code for that is <clears throat> three strikes and you're out. The E becomes an I. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's why they invented three strikes and you're out. It's a code. And the other is you just get the Z and you look at it in a rear vision mirror. It's an S. Mm -hmm. We all have mirrors now. Um, so then what they did was they they gradually put Elizabeth II Greg on all the coins, ending with the two pound coin on the 15th of June, 1998. And the days between the Elizabeth II Greg going on the 5p coin and going on the two pound coin is 11,011 days. And 11 means M. So it reads M0M, which spells mum. <laughs> Digital mum, M0M, mum. You know? So that's, that's kind of interesting, right? Because when you get into the Egyptian mythology and the Egyptian pharaohs or rulers, that you often get mother and son or sometimes get the mother and son, and the son marries the mother, or the mother marries the son, right? right. Whether, whether it's consummated, whether it produces children, it just puts things in the level of the myth, right? Of the, it, so it means that it's placed way up there. Um, yeah. Um, so I made, a, I made a little prediction that... Um, there would be no work on the apartment next door. And then as soon as I started to do an interview, there would be a guy drilling in the party wall. And it's just happened. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear it, but he's been drilling. He's just started drilling through the party wall. <laughs> okay. It's like people get controlled into being at certain places at certain times to do certain things like create some noise pollution. Sure. All right. So back to my question. Uh, so do you, you, you want to know what, how, how did the transfer happen? Well, not so much that yet, but, but, you know, so you filled in where the Rothschilds came in in 1815 and onward to have breeding rights. Um, yeah. Victoria uh, had a true wedding with uh, blind King George, who was a Hanoverian and, and Prince of Hanover. 
um, and produced Marcos Manuel that produced the lineage that has ended or so far with Francisco, and I believe he has a son. Um, so that is a certain bloodline lineage that is recognized. And throughout the book, or the series of books, the volume of books, The Hidden King, um, everything is pointed at Francisco and or his progeny or his son being the true hidden king. Okay, so I'm still, and then I hear what you say about Lemuria and, and would emerge out of Lemuria, where you're from originally New Zealand and, and all of that with the coinage, but I'm still unclear how your position is as you were uh, describing it, essentially as as the true king, as opposed to why isn't Francisco? Or is there a co-relationship there? Um, can you uh, explain that so we're clear? Because I'm not quite clear on that. Yeah, I can understand. I've got um, a lot of graphics that go with what I'm saying, right? Yeah. Uh, so, the, uh, which I could, you know, I could, we could do in detail talks for about, say, eight hours, and I can show you all the detail. Sure. Well, maybe we'll get to that in subsequent uh, yeah. uh, sessions. <laughs> um, well, the the original agreement we had was that I would write the book, and we would get it published. And uh, I would write the book, and do all the research, and he would find a publisher, and he would do the same number of interviews as me, mm -hmm. the same amount of hours as me. He didn't find a publisher. I found the publisher. I arranged the finance for the whole thing, which is about 300,000 euros. And um, he's done no interviews. And I gave him eight years. And um, what I got was uh, once I sent him the books and done it, I didn't get a phone call saying, well done. You know, it was four and a half years' work. So I rang him up and he said, yeah, nice, thanks, yeah, we're really pleased. And then a few days later, I got a text which was just completely off the wall, just terminating all relationship. Wow. And, um, and, and he took my financer with him. So I had no finances at the end of the project and I didn't even have enough finances to drive for three hours up to the marketing meeting, which I'd also arranged with big banner on the end of a plane, you know, giving the title of the book and then in the papers, local papers, where the talk would be, et cetera, promoting the books. Um, so I was left after four years work and raising all the funds and, and just exhausting all the funds. I was left living in a cave mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, by the sea, right? But um, what happened recently is I found out that the cave was predicted in the book of predictions, which was written in the first century AD and left about eight miles north of, six to eight miles north of Faro. And that was found by Sir Walter Raleigh on a British Let's Steal Portugal and Spain's books and put them in the Bodleian Library expedition. Right. So they in 1596, um, they, the British went to um, Spain, to Cadiz, and, and raided it for books. And then um, the drills just, can you hear the drill? Mm. <laughs> it's fantastic, no, yeah. isn't it? I've got somebody it's, running water above me, <laughs> oh, it's, it's, which it's, they it's, shouldn't be doing. Right, but. right under the party wall. So, um, so... So Walter Raleigh got the book of predictions and didn't give it to his commander Howard. He didn't give it to Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth I. And he kept it for himself and started Rosicrucianism. Right? Now, what he did from the book, he used to, he could read and write in six languages, Raleigh. So as soon as he got the book, he scanned it and you know, read, understands it all. And he, he goes ahead of the others and leaves and goes to where my cave was and takes photos of it, oh, sorry, um, does sketches of it and notes it and draws my cliff face, etc. And um, he spends a, a day and a night there 
And when I moved into that cave, locals who'd been in that in the family in that area for hundreds of years came to me and they said, Sir Walter Raleigh came and visited your cave, this cave. <laughs> yeah. And I thought, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, rings a bell, you know, <laughs> kind of know the name. <laughs> Uh, and so um, what happened was that he got the book of predictions and he cognizes it into a one drawing, which is a highly codified drawing called the Rosicrucian Cosmography. And it predicts who will run the end times and new age and when they will be and where they will be and what the name of the person is. And it gives the name of the person as Joseph Gregory Hallett, hmm. which is my name. And it gives the dates in a field about July 2014 and in a field about July 2017, which were absolutely accurate. Um, and it names the leader of Russia and names the leader of America. It, it shows what I'm doing. It names the shin. It, it names where, uh, when I, where, when I was born, um, and um, it's just fantastic. So, and it names me as the um, boy king. It uses the word Tut, as in King Tut, and it's written in a Memphis style. So I think what happened was once I'd finished the book that Francisco's brother-in-law, who's highly intelligent, and a Rosicrucian said, so you left Greg living in a cave, that cave, <laughs> right. This cave here points to the drawing. Cliff yeah. Face. Yeah. Look at this. That says Joseph. Look at that. Colon 604. That says second name Gregory. All right. You've made him the Rosicrucian boy king. Mm. I see. Right. <laughs> so the prediction takes precedence. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. So um, I ended up living there for about 123 days most of the time, like more than 100 days of that 123 days. And it was fantastic. It was absolutely fantastic. Like cuttlefish lighting up at night, looking down a 40-foot cliff face, cuttlefish lighting up at night. Um, dolphins going past, tourist pirate boats going past, two channels, day and night, two ads, dawn and dusk, no electricity, and crystal blue waters. And it was about 300 metres from the shops. <laughs> go up, do my shopping, go back to my cave, look at boating, etc. Mm -hmm. and it was just absolutely what I needed after four years on a computer. Yeah, and that was in Portugal. That was in Portugal in the Algarve. And the way they said that it would be in the Algarve is in the bottom right corner of the picture, they've got St. Anthony, who's holding an anchor. That's what St. Anthony does. And St. Anthony is the saint of Lisbon and Portugal. So it was saying this will happen in Portugal. Sure. By the way, we live at the, the base of uh, Mount St. Antonio. <laughs> oh, do you? Yeah. Really? <laughs> great, great. So we're, we're, we're speaking from St. Antonio. <laughs> yeah, excellent, excellent. It's also my um, Portuguese name is Antonio Pera. Mm -hmm. It means pure Antonio. Um, well, that's grand. That's, that's excellent. Um, so that's, that's what happened, and I've had no communication since. So Francisco's done no interviews, as far as I know. And he has not been in touch for four years now. Yeah, not well. been in touch. And then, um, and no finances, you know. The finances are just not him either, you know. So all gone. After I'd done the work, all gone. And he says, you know, great book, really well done, fantastic. And then, so no marketing budget, nothing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so then what if, what if, you know, I didn't start with this theory. I just came across this information, the Rosicrucian Cosmography. And then what happened was Sir Walter Raleigh found this, found my name, and then 
bred himself into my lineage. Mm -hmm. uh, so Walter Raleigh is my great times 13 grandfather. Mm. Okay. Well, I see that then. Okay. <laughs> which, yeah. is, which is nice, you know. And, 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 why, where, and, why and, and what is his ancestry? Well, he was married to Elizabeth Throckmorton, who was Henry VIII's granddaughter. Mm. Okay. And Sir Walter Raleigh's mother-in-law was half sister with Elizabeth I. Mm. Okay. So, uh, Sir Walter Raleigh was part of royalty. He's great friends with Sir Francis Bacon and um, Sir Robert Devereux, um, who were half brothers and who were the children of Elizabeth I. Right. As well. Right. So, he was basically the only non royal surrounded by royals. You know, he was part of the royal family and he's pretty much the most famous non royal person in. England, right through history. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then I found out that, that. Okay, well, that explains that. And that's interesting because it did, and when reading the book be, before I became clear of, of your declaration of who you are, um, you know, because the theme of the book or the, the five volumes is essentially that there is a, uh, a, lineage and a bloodline going back to Akhenaten coming through the so-called Davidic line. You mentioned King Tut and you mentioned Egypt as being the, the Trinity or the, the, the original template of family, father, mother, prodigal son, which was basically Akhenaten, Nefertiti and, and King Tut, Tutankhamen. Um, and, you know, if you can't take the three letters T-U-T -T, and you, um, soften the T, you get a D, and you harden the U, you get a V, and there you get DVD, and and there's that that phonetic mirroring of the Davidic root or phonetic um, uh, starting point of of the claim of a Davidic line, um, leading all the way up to uh, the insertion of the Rothschilds into the so-called royal line. Um, and even though Marcos Manuelo is considered the true um, legitimate son, the fact is that his mother and his grandmother still wore Rothschilds or had Rothschild uh, genetics or bloodline in it. And so I'm kind of getting the impression that at some point there was, in the period we have been in the last 10, 15 years and where we are now, from what you just related, that Francisco effectively terminated that that lineage or that claim, and uh, and there's sort of like a a switch of lineages or bloodlines that now has precedence or preeminence with your standing. Would you agree with that? Um, that appears to be what's happened. Mm -hmm. Okay. It does. Um, and. So what happened was that um, the, uh, the, in the terms of the occult, you've got things like Freemasonry, Rosicrucian, Templars, Illuminati, and Priory to Sion up the top. Right. And the, um, about the 2nd of June, the Priory to Sion contacted Francisco, who contacted me and said that we'd been chosen to represent the end times. Mm -hmm. um, so... And they wanted a sacrifice. <laughs> and, that, <laughs> and that sacrifice was me. Mm -hmm. Right? And I'm standing on the, on the same cliff face that Sir Walter Raleigh had drawn. So I had to come out of my cave. So I got in a cave. And if you're going to be a biblical figure, you have to live in a cave, right? Yeah. And they all lived in caves at some time. Now, if you've lived in a cave, uh, especially the gentleman living in a cave, you know, you might be fulfilling a biblical prophecy. So I come out of the cave, answering the phone, and stand on the exact cliff face that Sir Walter Raleigh had drawn that, that had been predicted in the first century AD in the book of predictions. And I'm getting this phone call, and it's a bit fuzzy, saying, you know, you're, 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 we've been selected. I've got, I've got good news, and I've got bad news. <laughs> <laughs> You've been selected to represent the end times, 
<laughs> but you've been selected for the sacrificial uh, <laughs> sacrament, yeah. right? Yeah. And then, um, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> and then uh, in the next week after that, about seven people around me died. Um, there was a, <clears throat> a car accident. There was well, a guy. A guy got stabbed on the beach about 400 yards away, swam around in front of my cave screaming help. And I didn't kind of, was that, did I hear that? I'm not sure, you know, choppy waters. And, and I was about nine paces back from the cave top. And then next day he, well, he swims around to another three or 400 yards, lands there, gets stabbed again and killed. He got killed. And then um, so a French tourist, young teenage girls driving down and, they got hit by a truck and I heard that. Truck pulled out and hit that. And one, two or three died there. And then about nine kilometers away, there was a gas explosion in the house and a famous artist and his gay lover, they got killed. I can, you know, these are all within hearing distance. And then Rick Mayle came to film 340 meters from me. And then instead of staying the night, he flew back that day and he, Died the next day about one thirty of undisclosed condition. Hmm. Um, so you know, coincidental? I don't know, um, but a lot of people died and I didn't, which I'm slightly happy about. But um, uh, yeah, anyway, so I represented the we we represented the end times, and two people represent the end times, and one person represents the new age, and. Um, it's, you got Ouroboros, which is the, around the sun. So you got, basically it's a blue snake and a yellow snake you're seeing in color and they flash on and off and they're chasing each other around the sun for 2000 years. Well, 2005. Right, well, Ouroboros is a snake that's eating its tail. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's actually two snakes, one chasing the other. Okay. Yellow and blue. So you got a lead, you got a leading snake and a following snake the following snake betrays the leading snake and eats it swallows it mm, okay and then regurgitates it and that's the act of betrayal as you see in biblical stories etc acts of betrayal judas betrays jesus right it's an act of betrayal and the person who's betrayed is the one that represents the new age. So that's how I came to represent the new age. Mm -hmm. I represented the end times with Francisco. That's 40 days. And it's from the 7th of July, 2014, which is 777, which is actually the number of the end times, 777. Mm -hmm. And it's actually 777 is actually written above the windows in Stoy palace which was exactly 51 kilometers away exactly and um that's called the end times palace and it's got 777 written above the windows but it's actually done to make it look like christmas pine trees mm -hmm. and when the light catches it there's your 777 um so you know whether francisco betrayed me or actually put me in the position because he had seen my name come up on the Rosicrucian cosmography as the person predicted to represent the end times new age and be the boy king as my name was on the coins from the age of six um, and then to 36, 1968 to 2008 and ongoing. And when I turned 56, at that time, there was 56 billion UK coins with my name on it. Elizabeth to Greg. And then Elizabeth had taken her face off the coins in 1968 and used her body double. She's got a name, something like Mrs. Sanderson, something like that. And you can see Mrs. Sanderson on the coins because she's got a different chin. It's more cannibalistic <laughs> it's, it's a greasier bigger clumpier chin all right and that's mr sanderson it's not elizabeth 
Mm -hmm. And when Elizabeth was sick a couple of years ago to do the Queen's speech at Christmas, New Year, that was Mrs. Sanderson talking. Yeah. And what do you do? <laughs> Where do they keep Mrs. Sanderson at the, in the basement of Windsor Castle? Uh, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, the bait, the bait, yeah, yeah. But we don't need to go um, in that path. Um, no. So, so what, yeah, what's happening is the fulfillment of predictions, which you know I'm quite happy about, mm -hmm. um, because so what they've done is in in many 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 ways, not you know even counting the 65 million, 65 billion times on the UK coins as one event. They've still named me as as the boy king and the king. Um, many 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 times. Um, including Queen Elizabeth's agents briefing me as though I was the sovereign. Mm. Right? Because from about 2002 to 2009, I was um, an intelligence confessor, which is a position that doesn't exist, but it means sovereign. Right, because intelligence goes and confesses to the king, says, "Well, this is what's really happening." You know, give me the skinny on it, and that's what I was getting. So much so that in two thousand and seven, the intelligence Christmas Eve party was at my place. Mm. <laughs> right, so um, the, you know the stories then go on and on and on, and 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 it is as surprising to me, but. When I look at the book of predictions, or rather what I've got access to, the Rosicrucian cosmography, and when I'm looking at uh, listening to royals in the Sangreal lineage, the blood royal lineage, relate the tradition received, which they often do in like a trance, they'll sit next to me and they'll go, <laughs> and then they'll say some stuff that they heard on a dinner table conversation, family dinner table conversation when they were a kid, you know. It's precious information, and they'll come out of the trance. Uh, that, and then all of Revelations in the Bible I fulfilled. Plus, I was initiated into the house of David. So I can claim to be first in the house of David. And that's what they've really been looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can, I can say that um, I'm at least twice. You know, and they've actually built something to state that I'm part of the House of David, if not first, you know. And in that one thing, there's about six different things that come into it and say, yes, 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 yes. Mm -hmm. Dating back over 100 years. Okay, so um, just to fill a couple of things in for people watching that um, uh, you... Um, use phrases like uh, sangreal, uh, royal blood, things like that. Um, many people confuse things and things have been confused purposely uh, with this thing called the Holy Grail, supposedly a cup holding blood. And um, it's an interesting play on language. San, which means holy or saint in Latinized uh, language is French, San Graal, which means the Holy Grail, um, but in French, Sang means blood, Real is the royal. So that's where this play on words and this switch between an image or a symbol as a cup holding blood versus the bloodline. And so what you've detailed is, um, is those converging, that fabric of history I referenced, the converging of bloodlines into you by predictive um, uh, documents, images, and so forth, and you ending up at the Port du Graal or Portugal on the coast. Uh, I always wondered for like decades, you know, I looked at geography, history, and things, and I always wondered, well, where, what, why did Portugal get birth? You know, where did this come from in the language Portuguese? And you know, it always seemed um, uh, fairly insignificant or inconsequential in history. Um, although you could see where the Portuguese lineage 
had significant positions in, in certain things uh, with the Jesuits and so forth. But I could never figure out what, where the name and the, 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 the race or the ethnicity of Portuguese came from until I read your book. And I go, oh, of course, Port du Grand, the port of the Grail, or the Sangreal, the, the royal bloodline. And you mentioned the Merovingians, um, which uh, some people know about, most don't. But that was a, a bloodline that ended up coming up from southern France between the 4th and 7th century, um, went into the Franks and Charlemagne, and Charlemagne to Otto the Great, which created the holy, so-called Holy Roman Empire and all the houses of Europe. Um, this is what I call the interweaving fabric of, of history. All the attempts to uh, justify and codify in this holographic matrix we exist in, uh, this preeminence authority to rule humanity, which I personally wholesale reject uh, because they haven't done a very good job at it to begin with. And, uh, and ultimately, when you get into the depths of it, it's all a cult of death. My, my background, my expertise is almost 30 years of studying law and money mechanics and how that's evolved in history and how all the esoteric things, uh, elements, numerology, language, gematria, and so forth, uh, how that's woven into the legal and the monetary system. You clearly have a masterful grasp of all of that and a vast uh, compendium of historical understanding of all of that. What, what I teach with, with, with our university and, and through the materials that we're bringing forward is to understand that, that this symbolic uh, codification in this holographic reality we're in is what has been used to entrain our minds to project and accept or consent to this hierarchical structure of royal lines and, and monetary dominance and all the rest of it. So now we're moving into the new age. Okay, a new astrological new age in terms of the astronomical relationship between the solar system, the planets, the cosmology, that larger hole in the galaxy and universe we live in. And we're coming into fulfillment, as you've been talking about. Fulfillment of predictive prophecies and all of that leading to your individual embodiment, personage, <laughs> and, and position. So... If you are the boy king here to pronounce or to open the gateway, so to speak, to the new age, in our point of view, our meaning, uh, the Pantera Society and so forth, um, awareness is equal to responsibility. And so here we are, many people starting to emerge as a biblical prophecy says, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Um, so we're all in many ways common people who are suddenly waking up to a much higher sense of awareness and responsibility. So where I'd like to go from here in this dialogue is how do you see your responsibility in the position you're in? Where do we go from here to start healing this world and setting things right um, uh, in the tradition of what Lawrence Gardner called the Grail King tradition, which is that a true king is one who is truly a servant of the people and is not self-aggrandizing in the egocentric way that we see going on today. Yeah. So yeah. there's a lot of responsibility in what you're describing. And there has been, a, in effect, an abdication from that bloodline leading to Francisco, as you just described it, to you. So what is your responsibility and where are we going to go from here? Um, well, what I would like to do first is have some more interviews where I show the graphics so that people can get really grounded into what I'm saying so that I establish my position first. Mm. Um, and it's most important that comes out because it's um, it's coming out in the media, in the mainstream media already. Um, I was in several movies last year that were directly alluding to me um, 
X-Men, uh, the Wolverine, Logan, um, the Mummy, and um, Baby Driver, Boy King, Baby Driver. Mm-hmm. The Rosicrucian cosmography shows me standing on the well, pulling a lever inside the castle, and I'm standing standing on the well of initiation, and the well of initiation is in Regal Era Palace, Regal Era Palace in Sintra in Portugal. Um, which Francisco's wife lived in when she was growing up. Um, and the name next to it is in Latin, but it is a combination of Putin and POTUS, President of the United States. So I'm standing on the well of initiation and there's basically Putin and Trump standing next to me. And I'm pulling levers inside the castle and out of the castle is a trumpet blowing, which is Trump, trumpet, Donald Trump. <laughs> um, so what I want to do is go through and explain this. And then as I was representing the end times, new age, the Rosicrucians, I'm, I'm not a member of any organization. I, I've never met any of these people. The Rosicrucians in about April, May 2014 brought out the Rosicrucian cosmography, put it on the front cover of their journal number 10, which is only one journal a year. And it was a colorized version of the cosmography. So it was a lot clearer to see. So they kind of knew that the new age was happening around then. And they were right, you know, as it happened a couple of months later. So the, what happens with the, the end times is 40 days and then the new age is 40 days. So that's the period. And 40 days means it's code for a larger kingdom or a kingdom for longer. So the end times was 40 days from 7 July 2014 to the 16th of August 2014, which has the numbers 777 and 787. And then it's from the 16th, the new age was from the 16th of August to the 25th of September, which is 787 to 797. So it's highly codified, you know, so, and they say that um, uh, the truth is in proportion. You know, everything must be in proportion. So you look for things that are in proportion. They can be consecutive, etc. cetera. Um, so, you know, that was, that was a huge event. Um, and um, it's a bit like the 6-5, the macrocosm, microcosm, where the, Macrocosm comes down and then the microcosm, so you've got the five as a person, six is the whole super universe. And um, so what I, what I did is I, I went around to archaeological sites to check them and you know, occasionally I'd check them and find that they were energy points, right? So I went to this one particular archaeological site near Alvor and... Um, it had a bit of grass on it, which is rare, and it was fine grass. And it was turning into a hexagon. The grass was turning into a hexagon pattern. And I was going, that's a hexagon. And then it would turn into a pentagon pattern about a minute and a half later. And I'm going, ah, oh, it's a pentagon. And then <laughs> 90 seconds later, I go, ah, oh, it's a hexagon. So it was a 6-5 point where there was the energy coming down, the energy going out. So it happens in, in places, and it happens in... Um, in uh, time as well. So the end times new age was a, a major point for that. And then after that, we had the times of the end. So the end times new age was predicted to be in the Rosicrucian cosmography done in the first century in Pharaoh, which means Pharaoh, which means king or ruler. Um, it was done um, in the first century and was predicted and they gave the date as XX, which is 20, and then a big one, which was a feather, and then a four, which was another feather. And the feather um, is in Portuguese is Pina, and Pina Palace was built by King Dom Ferdinand II of Portugal, who had brought Marcos Manuel to Portugal, Prince Marcos Manuel to Portugal, Queen Victoria's firstborn son. And then he built the sister palace, which is called Stoy Palace, which is the palace of Easter resurrection. And it's the end times palace. So when they said 
it's in a field about July 2014, and they did the one and the four with a feather. They were indicating Stoy Palace, you know. So they're quite fantastic in their um, in their detail. And so as I tell the story, eventually, what I'd like to do is show you the detail as I go. I'll give you an overall now, right? And I want people to be grounded into the overall picture so they don't go, I'm blowing my own trumpet. <laughs> yeah. You know? um, so um, I've, I've um, just finished one, but um, I'm, I'm just finishing the, um, the study of the Rosicrucian cosmography now. It's, it's pretty intense. It's taken me about 19 months or so. Um, but... In the, in the Mummy, which came out with a Tom Cruise movie that came out in um, uh, 2017, I think it was the 22nd of May, that actually names me. It says, um, um, the mummy who plays Isis, the Egyptian goddess, which is Mary. Um, <clears throat> in the Christian trinity, it says... Um, um, Hallett, you are the chosen. Joseph, you accept. Hmm. Right? And then right at the end of moving, of, of filming the movie on the last day, around about the last day, I was helping a friend out down in town. And um, <clears throat> this cameraman comes along surrounded by some women who were like in their about 45, 50 or something. So they come along, these women come along, and then they part, and then there's this guy with a big box camera. It's about this big, big box camera, and he's filming me, and I'm going, what the? Like that, right? What are you doing filming me? You know, because I'm trying not to be filmed. And they got that section, and they stuck it in the movie as me emerging out of Big Ben. <laughs> yeah. Yeah? And Big Ben is... Um, uh, on New Zealand Day 2012, which is the 6th of February, its name was changed to Elizabeth Tower. Right? So they had me emerging out of, uh, of Elizabeth Tower. And I was about five stone heavier then, so you can imagine. And they, they, they've even got my shoulder width in there, you know, they've got absolute proportion. And then they've got half of Elizabeth just showing one eye, which means like she's an Illuminati stool and she's just there looking out out mm. of the tower, you know? Mm -hmm. And they're blowing up the tower in the movie. They're blowing up Big Ben, which is Elizabeth Tower, right? And they wanted to... Um, they, were, they were delaying the renovation of Elizabeth Tower for about four years, and they needed some event to mark the start of the renovations, which would go on for another four years, which is during the final years of the tribulation, which is about three and a half years, right? Which goes from about, tribulations goes from about 2010 to 2020. That's a screen there. <laughs> um, and uh, so what they did is they, they started the renovations of Elizabeth Tower on the day that the US was having a solar eclipse. The solar eclipse wasn't predicted by anyone to happen, and it was a completely clouded over day. Nevertheless, the US was having a solar eclipse. So the message was, Ben means sun, right? So Big Ben means big sun. The big sun is acknowledged by us as eclipsing Elizabeth, as eclipsing the once towering Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, get the message? Yeah, See, they, I understand. They codify, they, codify, they codify the message, right? So they're saying that New Zealand Day, so it's someone from New Zealand is eclipsing Elizabeth. So that was in, on the 21st of August, 2017. And they'd already named me in The Mummy, which, you know, The Mummy is what British people call their mother and, you know, right. to the Queen. And they're saying, um, Hallett, you are the chosen. Joseph, you accept. Mm -hmm. Right. And, it go, and then they, she says, E, you are the heir. E, you are the heir, right? And I've got an E in all of my names. Joseph, Gregory, Hallett. It's an E in every name. It goes, E, you are the heir. 
and then Tom Cruise is playing me, he nods three times for each E, right? Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the, the, they've really codified it. And um, uh, actually, when he, when he was filming it, uh, oh, no, that was earlier. That was earlier. It was 2012. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, one, one time he's filming here, he's staying with an acquaintance. So, yeah, so Tom Cruise has a place in Byr- overlooking Byron Bay in um, east coast of Australia. And his neighbour is Hugh Jackman, who plays Wolverine. Right. And they both represented me in movies and, and named me um, in, in 2017 movies about um, one or two months apart. Which is kind of interesting. It just sounds like they're having a barbecue on their on their terraces overlooking Byron Bay and going, "Oh, let's let's give this guy Joseph Gregory Heller a crack and we'll put him in the movies. You know, we'll name him and <laughs> and, and allude to him according." And, and the secret orders are going, "Yeah, we need to name this guy. We need to mm-hmm. get it out there as to who he is uh, through uh, as much as many mediums as possible, film and." So, uh, were film. you were you invited to the to be on the set of the Mummy? No, no, no. I don't. I didn't even know it was being filmed. I didn't know anything about it. You know, it was it was guerrilla filming. What they did when they filmed me, it was guerrilla filming. You know? Oh, I see. Okay. And so the the guy with big box camera comes walking down the street with six women in front of him, so no one can. I can't see him. Oh, and I see. Part he's filming me from about this far away, and I'm going what the? And that's what they used. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, no doubt there'd be a story coming out saying yeah. something, we filmed something else or whatever, but you know, it's, it's recognizably me <clears throat> and the dates fit and the, the uh, eclipse fits. You know? Yeah. So back to my question, mm. um, here we are now in, in mm. this time, moment. Yeah. Uh, uh, almost November. Uh, today is October 30th. Tomorrow is their Halloween and the next day, the day of the dead and, uh, 2018, um, a very propitious and significant uh, pivot point coming up in a week. Uh, the elections here and all the stuff going around, all of that. Um, uh, I suspect next week is going to start some pretty significant things after the election. It's an interesting day. Next Wednesday is 11 7 11. So you've got your 11 11 there flanking the seven. Um, the, um, you know, I look at things, we as the Pantera Society look at things in a practical level. That is what our mission statement is. Uh, I introduced us in the beginning as the Gemstone Global Media. We're beginning to come out on a, a little bit in the public. We've kept Pantera very, very quiet and very private. We've been building it for 20 years. Uh, it's a private society. Uh, it's not a public entity. It's not a corporate entity and all of that. And Gemstone right now is a university where we teach people a lot about all this kind of stuff. History, esoterica, uh, all of those components, the, the legal monetary system. But it all leads for us towards practicality. What I said just a moment ago, responsibility. We, we have taken on ourselves the responsibility of this world. We have uh, significant intentions with the media to open up more levels of revelation and truth. We are in what I like to call, we're riding the waves of the apocalypse. It's a waveform moving through the particle incrustation of this overlay of the false reality, whether we're talking about false royals, flat live royals, false, Uh, systems, monetary systems of bondage, things like that. That's all breaking open. We're revealing the truth. The truth brings awareness, but with awareness comes responsibility. We have taken on ourselves the responsibility to mobilize bringing the truth out, but also to ground it into real works. Uh, What are we going to do with this world? We've got seven and a half billion people, half of whom are on the edge of survival. ecosystems are being destroyed, all of that. So with your position, and I believe you're in a, from everything I've heard you say in this conversation, 
you're at a significant pivot point as well. Everything that's led up to this moment has solidified who you are, where you stand, and your position. Um, clearly, it's not completely free of the old if, if what happened to your publisher was not an accident and the, the you know, illness you had to purge yourself through and all of that. Um, but from my point of view, the, the, um, those who stand with life and support life in this world have already won. Now it's both the cleanup and the rebirthing and the re-establishing of new systems in this world that support and enhance life and everybody in the world. So my question back to you is, what are you going, what do you have formulated for yourself where your intention is going in terms of now from this pivot point of what we've talked about so far, what does the future look like for Gregory, uh, Joseph Gregory Hallett, three E's, uh, the, <laughs> the heir of Joseph and uh, the guy on 65 billion coins. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, I've tried to have my information um, heard in court. I deposited about 300 pages of information disclaiming the Prince Pretender status. And, um, disclaiming what? I didn't hear that. They, they, uh, I, I went to the High Court Queen's Bench in the UK and put a case forward and paid my £10,000 deposit to claim Prince Pretender of the United Kingdom. Mm. And if the British royal family is is legitimate, they should have no problems with someone claiming to be the Prince Pretender. But the um, two judges refused to hear the case. The first judge, he had to be a High Court Queen's Bench judge, which was the top judge. And the first judge was a District Court Circuit judge called Martin Parry, who was the lowest judge. District Court Circuit judge is a joke. And he signed it as though he was a High Court Queen's Bench judge. So I recused him, which means to get rid of him, start from the beginning. Right. And then, so I got another judge, and this time it was um, um, a High Court Queen's Bench judge, um, uh, Daniel John Pierce Higgins QC. And he misread my recusing uh, District Court Circuit Judge Martin Parry because he was a circuit judge and not a High Court's Queen's Bench judge as an appeal to appeal, mm -hmm. which it wasn't. It was just getting rid of him. Um, so um, he said the appeal to appeal is denied. But I was just recusing the first judge because he was lying and biased. So I recused the second judge as well. And then because there was 80 counts of bias between the two of them, it was actually found in my favor. Because hmm. <laughs> when, you, when you've got biased judges under certain rules, 3.531, I think it is, in combination with um, uh, another rule, um, you are allowed to fight in your favor with the courts because effectively twice the judges have been absent. No. And bias means it's found in your favor. Um, so what they're doing is they're, they're agreeing with me, but they're not putting it affirmatively in writing. They're doing passive acquiescence. Right? And um, rather than um, cognitive affirmation. So um, they're kind of waiting for media, really. So what I really want to do is to show all of my visuals which are quite substantive and um like what i'd like to do is to go through even with you with my little videos i've got on me being named as the holy grail by monty python <laughs> have you seen those on the website uh no you say no okay so um in 1975 no. monty yeah, python you, uh, let me just interject this now when you say the website you're referring to the new website the uh um, um, yeah, www.kingof.uk. Right. Yeah, which I, I just really found out 
yeah. uh, was up just um, recently. I, I haven't had time to look at it. That's I've fun. Seen, I've seen a lot of it from before, all the things you're referring to, but uh, not this one. So just so yeah, everybody like, knows that that's your new website. You, the new website is kingof.uk. And if you're going to order any books or, or um, uh, Amazon things, um, order it through the new website, kingof.uk. Um, if you order anything on the old website, it goes to a deceased account and they're not letting me transfer the whole thing over. Right. So, you know, more obstruction. So um, the two movies, um, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, 1975, they've got the writing on the wall and the writing on the wall, if you flip it left to right and upside down, left to right for the Freemasons, then upside down for the Illuminati, it says Holy Grail, but it also says Greg Hallett. And it also says 777, meaning Gregory Hallett, Holy Grail, will be running the shin. And that's 1975. From, from 1975, the New Zealand government, New Zealand judiciary, and the CIA believed that I was the Holy Grail. And I used to watch San on Beach Road in Tauranga in New Zealand, which is the biggest volume harbour, and watch heroin being dropped off boats on a pallet, with the pallet broken open, with dark blue and black jerry crayons attached to the broken arms of the pallets. And then two divers and then two wetsuit guys and another two guys on the shore dragging the heroin up. And it was 300 metres, 300 yards of, of water that was from the channel from that deep, from that deep, about a foot deep to no depth at all. So you could actually see them dragging it up. Hmm. And the person, and then, then it was taken up to, um, short way up the hill, turn left, down to a dead end street, to a house that I used to, that I was gardening the neighbours for, which was a relative of the person in that house. And that person who was in that house then um, is now the Deputy Prime Minister of New Zealand called Winston Peters. Hmm. So in 1975, the heroine was being taken to his place out of the harbour to his house. And um, virtually every New Zealand Prime Minister, every, every um, leader of the opposition in New Zealand who's become Prime Minister has been a heroin trafficker. And it's called the Queen's Heroin. And that's run by Prince Philip. Hmm. He uses the heroin to try and... Um, <clears throat> Eliminate the Holy Grail, who's got a stronger claim to the throne. That's why they're doing it. So they've been attacking that on me since I was 15. Um, so um, I'm not sure if that answers the question. Well, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> we may get back up to it this, this session or the next one. Uh, are you finished describing your case with the two judges and the recusal? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so the, the, what's happening is that the 10,000 pounds I put forward, what the judges are doing is, is denying cases in with the line. It takes them five minutes to deny a case and they keep 10,000 pounds <laughs> because they're laundering heroin money. Mm. Interesting. And I published that in 2015 and, uh, it was, quite, it was well received by a lot of people. Yeah, and then so what happened was the um, Elizabeth had to abdicate to me again, and one of the ways they abdicate to me is through heroin. How right. so? How so? Um, well, bringing it out of the harbour right in front of me, so I can see where it's going, mm -hmm. and and um, I produced a poster in 2016, large poster showing the illegitimate royal family and how it was illegitimate and who the true royals were and with me on there as well, including Francisco next to me. Um, and the deadline for them to rebut that was 1 minute 001 a.m. 1st of January 2017. Now, 40 days means a large kingdom or a kingdom for longer. So if they're going to, transfer, if they're going to acknowledge me then 40 days after that, which is the 9th or 10th of February, they're going to do something. So what they did is they got 360 kilograms of cocaine 
and dumped it on the beach right next to the closest to me where I am in East Anglia. And if you take three different roads to get to that particular location, they're all exactly 40 miles. Hmm. Right. <laughs> so what I was saying is you've got the kingdom. We're, we're, we're dropping heroin, heroin and cocaine, and it's symbolically the same thing, called the Queen's heroin. And yeah. no one can go for it. No one's come in and claimed that 360 kilograms of cocaine, right? 360 means the full picture. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Full circle. Full circle. Yeah, full circle. I mean, 40 means a bigger, larger kingdom for longer. And the date being 40 miles and the date being 40 days after I presented them with the royal family with the poster showing that they were illegitimate and that we were legitimate, they then waste, they stamp that with the value of 360 kilograms of cocaine which is worth less uh, money. Four, four million pounds, maybe? Four million pounds. It's been a while since I checked the market price. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Were they trying to hand off the family <laughs> business to you? <laughs> um, so, you know, I had a detective come up to me and, and, and talk to me about it, and he's fronting by having two kids with him, two little kids who are about sort of six and seven, boy and a girl that's, Maybe his children, maybe not, maybe just the front. But, um, you know, I told him this, they, they, they couldn't work out what it was about, and I told him the story. And, um, you know, they were seriously listening. And then I said, what usually happens is Prince Philip, who's the head of the triumvirate, which is the heroin trafficking, right? Prince Philip's the head of it, right? Because he wants to nab the, the, um, the Holy Grail. It's, it's a threat to the throne, right? So what Prince Philip invented, he's in, the, he's in the Navy, is he invented the seahorse, which is a screamer. And so they, they usually dump the heroin, um, so it's weighted, and it's got a, a seahorse on it and goes to the bottom of the sea. And then the seahorse goes up about, let's say, 10 o'clock at night for about 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. It screams in high-frequency scream, so you need a, a screamer decoder so you can hear it. And then you go to that location, you try to get there in 20 minutes before the screamer drops down and then you grab hold of it and then you can pull up the heroin. And this time they got 360 kilograms of cocaine and they let it wash ashore with no screamer. Mm -hmm. right? So that's pointing the finger. The heroin traffickers are pointing the finger at Prince Philip saying, Prince Philip, you're a failure. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So bringing us back to, um, to my question. Um, what can I do? What have I done? What can I do? What am I doing? Well, it, it seems like how you've answered it is with the description of the court case and some of the other elements pointing to you in, in movies and all these things. So I think it's quite clear of all the elements which you want to present in further sessions and um, in other works that you're going to come out with all of the cross-referencing, verification, all of that. So let's say that's a given, you know, this is where we're at. Mm. But it sounds like what you're describing with the court case that do you see your direction or requirement is to actually quote unquote, take the throne? Or do you see it going in a different direction? And, and we're, you know, what is your outcome that you you're seeking? Um, uh, well, and one of the things I need because I I used to get things signed by, um, by notaries in an affidavit, but in about July 2015, 16 July 2016, the notaries started to refuse to notarize my stuff hmm. because they swear two O's to the Queen, but privately the notaries have said to me. We know the British royal family has been illegitimate for generations. But it's our job. We have to swear two O's and people rely on us, right? So people know that the British royal family is illegitimate and they're very aware that James Hewitt is the father of Prince Harry. And they're very aware that Prince William is the son of King Juan Carlos of Spain. All right. And I um, toppled the 
Queen of Holland in 2013, and I toppled the King of Spain in 2014, which is also actually drawn in the Rosicrucian cosmography. It actually shows the king falling over my cliff face. And <laughs> she incredibly accurately draws my cliff face. And I was on that cliff face when King Juan Carlos of Spain had abdicated. And um, I had predicted six weeks earlier that he was going to abdicate. And that when he did abdicate on the 29th of May, Saturday at 10 a.m. on radio, a Sachin Coburg and Gota congratulated me at 6 p.m. that night for predicting it. And at the same time that that was happening, Portuguese Navy parked outside my bay and saluted me. That <laughs> was good. Um, so, um, what, what am I, what am I, how am I going to go about it or what am I going to do? Mm-hmm. Uh, the, it, it's predicted that the signs or marks would go to a certain point in time, which is 2017, and then stop, and they have. So I've still got to show the marks of 2017, which I would have done, but I was sick for about five months. Um, and then after I was sick and after my webmaster publisher, Ina Commercial, had died, um, my computer then failed three times. So hard drive, had to get a new graphics card, had to get another new hard drive, had to get a new keyboard, and had to get a new microphone, had to get a new camera, you know, and all this stuff, delays, delays, delays. So what I'm trying to do is to possibly get 12 good people to sign my affidavits so that I can put them up on my website so that they can then be acknowledged as legal documents Mm -hmm. of uh, the many and various ways that I've been made uh, sovereign king, monarch Mm -hmm. of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and all Ireland. And I have a letter from Queen Victoria saying, you are the, um, it says assemble and claim it. It's got a blood from print on it. And, um, uh, it says a symbol and claim it to the throne and crown of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and all Ireland. And I was given that letter three times in 2010, 2000, in 2012, 2013, and 2014. Right. So um, I have some royal marks that substantiate, but I'm, I also have some royal lineage going back to second century, first century AD, as well as the 1500s. Mm-hmm. What happened was um, to establish the Holy Grail lineage, those who were part of the Holy Grail lineage, who were kings and queens, faked their executions and bred inside children again to produce the Holy Grail lineage that would have royal ancestry, but would also be the true Jesus Mary lineage. Um, which goes back to the Egyptian as well. And they've done that for me. Mm -hmm. So that was nice. And they've been doing that since 1500s. Mainly 1500s, 1600s. Yeah. Yeah. And then when um, uh, Ancestry.com started, they had to, you know, use one family history right, to show an example so that people would go, oh, yeah, if you can discover my history too, you know, I'll give you five pounds a month kind of thing. And the family history that Amazon dot, um, Ancestry.com started with was my family history. Hmm. So I got, lot, I got a lot of my family history for free. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's, up, that's, up in, that's up in Utah with the Mormons, so that's a whole other storyline. <laughs> no, this is, this is Cape Cod. This is mm-hmm. um, how it's at Cape Cod. Yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, the ancestry done come. Um, we've got about, uh, actually, we ended up not taking our hour break. So we've got about 15 minutes to wrap up uh, for a two hour session. Um, we could always take a break. No, let's just, uh, I've got some other things I got to get to. Okay. 
afternoon. Um, so we'll do, we'll go for about another 12, 15 minutes. Um, well, I'll, okay, I've got something here that you might like to see. Okay. Um, um, you got to move the screen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can you see Anubis there? Is the head, the eye, nose, shoulder, head? Mm -hmm. Is it showing up in that light? Yeah, yeah. It yeah. is? Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's what came out of the tree. And also to fulfill the apocalypse thing, the four horses of the apocalypse, is a horse there. You see a horse head there as well? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah. what that says, that, that's confirmation the head of the house of Joseph. So that, that split, and from a bit of the tree that remained standing was um, a lion's face, half a lion's face and half my face, right? Yeah. And as the Bible predicts, it says it'll be a lion's face and a man's face um, and um, a horse, and um, it'll be uh, a monster with a thousand eyes, which mm. is an oak tree. Mm. If you look, if you stand under an oak tree and you look at it, it's got eyes in front, many eyes in front, many eyes behind, many eyes within. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's an oak tree. It's just sure. described an oak tree, you know? Yeah. Um, so this is oak. And then, um, you know, I was given this, this rule mark here, which fits in with the Rosicrucian cosmography. Mm -hmm. It actually is. It, it is actually the key to the Rosicrucian cosmography. It just slots in twice, so that side and that side. Yeah, mm -hmm. and um, what it says is um, focus. It says um, pull it back a little bit. Prince, Prince Regent John, Duke Governor, Ports of the Algarve, and Duke Governor means king to be. So mm -hmm. I was given this, and it fits into the Rosicrucian cosmography. And also slots in here quite nicely. Little thing there. Um, yeah, so that was the Anubis that came out. And the other side was, uh, left standing was a lion and then my face there. So, yeah, just, just fulfilled it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so and that, that's how things are done. I'll, I'll take some, I'll present some better pictures of it, you know. Okay. Well, we'll schedule another session soon, uh, but to... Finish one question I have. Many people listening might have the same question. Um, yeah. How how are you protected or secure where you're at now in terms of um, your personal safety? And and you said that the, your hard drives were taken and things like that. Do you have your documentation and your um, electronic archives uh, replicated and secure? Um. Well, see, the other thing they did was massive financial attack. Yeah, uh, right. You know, like, like I didn't have PayPal even from 2007 to a um, couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. you know, for, so, so for about 11 years, and <clears throat> for actually for 11 years. And the reason they do that is because they want to, they want you to note the number 11. Right. Right. It's really important, 11 degrees, 11 years. They like um, the number 11. They, they like it. They like it. So they've, they've marked me with the number 11. So in terms of um, uh, um, the other thing I've got here, came out of the tree. I might as well show you now. It's, um, Zeus's thunderbolts came out of the tree. <laughs> you know, from the... Yeah, okay. The Mm -hmm. uh, uh, no, I'm just, it's, it's like, you know, if you've got, if you've got things, if you're not being hindered, you can make plans. Sure. But uh, I've just got to rely on my senses. I know, I know when, when there's a target, a target person around, you know, that's targeting me or whatever, or focusing on me, I sort of 
sense it. But um, yeah, so nothing. Mm. <laughs> Just rely on the cosmos for your security. I do yeah. entirely. Yes, I do. I do, and I've seen what's happened to some people who've tried to attack me, and it's just phenomenal, phenomenal what happens to them. Mm-hmm. And I, I just do nothing, absolutely nothing. Yeah. And they're having fits and all sorts mm-hmm. of problems. Yeah. And and back to the question of your your archives and so forth. Do you have those uh, secured and replicated? Um. Um. No, no, it's the next job. It's the next job. Okay. All right. I've just, well, what's, what they've done is, you know, I would have done that straight away, but then, you know, I had to spend quite a bit of money fixing the hard drive and getting another hard drive and getting a graphics card and getting a new keyboard and getting a new yeah. camera. And new but, I mean, the, the things that were taken when your, your publisher, I guess, after she died, their offices were raided and stuff, were those, uh, uh, um, uh, you said that was a back. So do you know that was a backup. Yeah. So um, uh, someone working for the Windsors, actually with the surname Windsor, stole my four terabyte hard drive in London. Yeah. Uh, reason, keep in mind for the future, backups supposed to be buried in a can somewhere where they don't know where it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it was in the middle of the Black Forest, you know, five hours drive from any airport. It was pretty well hidden. Yeah. Um, so what they did is they just got people in the most vulnerable situation and then took advantage of that. So what, what they do is on everyone now, they have um, a full cycle. Like if we wanted to get rid of this person, what things would we need to engage and disengage to topple that person to ruin everything? Right. And they go, okay, we'll kill the publisher. We'll give the child a sickness. We'll stop a payment on a couple of jobs. We'll stop them getting PayPal. Um, will um, uh, any commission emails will stop? Will st- stop any finances coming in from overseas? Um, we'll hassle him with phone calls. We'll restrict his phone calls so he doesn't get all his phone calls. The on button on his phone won't work. Will work periodically, and then random stuff will come up. Um, we'll um, prevent his book sales, and what we'll do is we'll get book orders for books that are out of publication and we'll put those just enough that he'll publish and then he won't get any more orders after that. So he'll be in debt on the books. Um, and then he's got 40,000 pounds up and he's printed all his books, which are worth 400,000 pounds. So we'll steal 90% of those and we'll make it look like other people did it. Um, and so we'll give no access to those books and we'll give him no communication as to whether those books are still there or not. We'll steal his hard drives and we'll stop all communication from his publisher. We'll deny him access to the lawyer, the death certificate, so he won't be able to transfer the Amazon account to his own name, uh, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Plus, we'll steal his car, and which they've done, and we'll steal his camera. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we'll steal his other hard drive and we'll gang stalk him on the... Uh, various groups and talk shows around and we'll have military people inviting him to talks and um, that's with military people undercover and we'll steal as much information of them as we can there and invite them back on the promise of a bigger trip but make it less a trip with the same people not listening and then we'll record them in absolute blur vision with really poor sound quality from a terrible angle with all paraphernalia, with the mic recorded on Omnisound, not directional mic. Um, And we'll get that video to him seven months late and we'll do that repeatedly. You know, it's just just phenomenal. So instead of, and and the other thing, we'll put him in court uh, for 18 years and then um, we'll charge him with someone else's criminal record and then put him in his name and then um, we'll, put so many cases against them, which were all bogus, but it would actually take him his entire lifetime to get off those bogus cases, Mm. some of which were actually a 1,000 miles from where he lived, or Mm. sorry, 800 miles. Just goes on and on and on, you know? And it's just what they're doing is leaving a trail, confirmation that they know who I am. Yeah. I wouldn't do this otherwise, because, you know, people go, you're the most targeted individual I've ever met, right? Mm -hmm. And and they they test me biologically, and they go, "You've, you've... 
you've got responses like you're in fight or flight for the last 20 years. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and um, so um, just go with it. You know, I, I can't do anything else. And the other thing they did is, um, yeah, and I won't get into that. Um, yeah, so what they're trying to do, what they're trying to do is to make me illegal in every country in the world. Mm -hmm. That's what they're trying to do. And they started doing that in 1988 when I first went to the Tower of London where two of my ancestors were supposedly executed but weren't. They immediately changed the immigration rules so that someone born in New Zealand used to have a grandfather born in England. They could go to the UK and work. And they immediately changed it to someone whose father was born in England um, could reside and work in the UK. So they changed that law to try and stop me getting into the UK. And then, so I'm in Amsterdam for 15 months and I'm allowed there three months <clears throat> in, sorry, in Holland. And a an, uh, female blonde immigration agent comes up to me on Friday night, about 10.30 at night in January 2013, and says, how come you're here? How, how come you're allowed to be here for so long? And I said, oh, I've got a bunch of titles. And so I reeled off my titles, you know, which is, um, some of them are quite lofty, like Lord Chancellor of the Kingdom of England, etc." and um, Lord Chancellor of the Duchy of Sachsen Coburg and Gotha. And she said, I believe you. And she went back and told um, Queen Beatrix of the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And then she resigned on the Monday. Wow. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> and then similar thing with King Juan Carlos of Spain. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also organized the laws of succession which I did in 2010, and then Queen Elizabeth enacted that in 2014 and backdated it to 25th of April 2013, which was the day I was elevated above her. Mm -hmm. So that was another abdication. Yeah. Um, and I was registered in the Holy See as a member of the Star family, which means descended from Jesus and Mary, which which all the royals of the UK and Europe try to claim descendancy from in order to substantiate their monarchies. Right. So yeah, I, was, I, was, I was, I was going to bring up that sector, the church, the Holy See. We'll have to bring that in, in session number two. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, all right. Well, we are, uh, we are done in terms of two hours. Um, I wanted to, uh, um, I was going to bring this in earlier and discuss it, but we'll end with this and um, pick it up next time because I still have that posed question, where do we go from here? I mean, I'm very clear what you're dealing with, where you've come from, who you are, what you're doing in terms of um, uh, not only legitimize, legitimizing, but substantiating by essentially uh, stepping into the role um, your, your position, because for me, it still always gets back to the practicality. What are we going to do to clean up this world? I believe very firmly. I know very firmly we are going to do that. We've already achieved what we need to, to ensure that. Now we just have to move through the last, the last layers of resistance, which you've just described in the last five minutes. <laughs> um, so I'm very pleased to meet you, and uh, I wish to establish a very firm grounding of cooperation and collaboration. Uh, Pantera and Gemstone are going to significant levels of what we're going to achieve, and uh, within behind my question about responsibility and what are you going to do, it's more what are we going to do, because I consider that question as an inclusive question. People who are really committed to seeing this world turned around are coming together have already come together and so i'm really pleased to make this connection with you and um so i'm going to finish with what i just looked at earlier before we started on your new website you have a quote under about um and this is a quote from 
the meditations of Emperor Caesar Marcus Aurelius Antonius, who ruled or was uh, Caesar from 161 to 180. Quite possibly Jesus' great, 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 great grandson, as per your writing in The Hidden King of England, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the quote that obviously you feel very strongly about, uh, or you wouldn't put it at the top of about in your new website, uh, I'll read it as, constantly regard the universe as one living being, having one substance and one soul, and observe how all things have reference to one perception, the perception, perception of this one living being, and how, how all things act with one movement, and how all things are the cooperating causes of all things which exist. Observe, too, the continuous spinning of the thread and the contexture of the web. So what we've been talking about is the continuing spinning of the contexture of the web of the history of this world, that which is seemingly known, which is all a lie, and that which is hidden, which is now being revealed on the waves of the apocalypse, so that... Uh, yeah. the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And so we have a lot of responsibility in that to move this, forward. There's, in there's code in that, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And it's that the last person to represent the end times new age was Jesus, or otherwise known as Joshua, Emmanuel, John, Yeshua, John Ram. Um, so... Um, his descendants were the five good emperors. And what you just read from Emperor Caesar, Mark Antonio Aurelius, was more spiritual writing than in the entire Bible. And he's, a, he's an Emperor Caesar, and he's supposed to be a big bully. Yeah. Right? But he wasn't. He was... Uh, and they were all were extremely spiritual people because they were taught by Jesus, who survived his execution and lived in just above Pharaoh in the Algarve, who wrote the Book of Predictions, which mentioned me. And now I'm sort of named in, in various movies, including the 1961 Italian movie La Noite, means the night. Um, so uh, what was your other question? There was another angle to it. Um, well, yeah, I was just not real. I mean, we have questions pending, but we'll have to pick them up next time. It's, you know, um, but yeah, it's fantastic. It's a fantastic quote. And so the Caesars were more spiritual than the entire Bible. And Jesus writings were actually removed from the Bible by Paul. And the Bible is actually Paulist. It's not Pauline. Jesus, yeah. It's Pauline. Yeah. It's Paulism. Um, he wrote at least a third of the Gospels, maybe more, and they took the Jesus stuff out. Now, where it, where it says the first should be last and the last should be first, it says, I am the Alpha and Omega, which is I am the first and the last. But it's actually I am the Omega and the Alpha, which means I represent the end times and the new age. Mm -hmm. The last and the, and the first, the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, so, so that's what it's about. The whole thing is the code for who represents the end times new age. Mm -hmm. and the, so it's the Omega and the Alpha, which is when you consider the saying, the first shall be last, the last shall be first. Alpha and Omega becomes Omega and Alpha. Yeah, yeah. You but yeah, the Rom Romanization of, of all of that with the Paul lineage and, and the Roman church taking over, I mean, it's part and parcel of the same thing, the overlay of the false reality oh, yeah, yeah. well it's actually worse than that um because paul was working for emperor nero and emperor nero faked his suicide and paul died at the same time mm. and then nero in his fake suicide became an ancestor of the rothschild family mm. interesting yeah yeah so well, um, it's also the the linguistic symbology of uh, Saul, which is the son, converting to Paul, which is a pa, which is the father, and then it all gets embodied in this so-called apostolic succession with the the father, the pope, um, which gets into the 
you know, the, the Holy Sea, and you talked earlier about, uh, about the sea, emerging from the sea, all the work that, that I focus on and that we bring forward has to do with how the entire legal system of bondage, um, and I've written a document that, that I'll, I'll send you um, when we get off air, we'll exchange contact, um, called The Overview of the World System of Bondage and Separation from Life. And I go very extensively into related complementary things to what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. But it's all about being lost. And you, you, I know it was you talked about the letter C or the, um, the word C is a homophone of the letter C. You've got yeah. the C, S-E-A, as in the mm -hmm. ocean. And then we're considered lost at sea when you get into the Sesta V Act and, mm -hmm. and the lost of a Sesta V or the living beneficiary for the estate. And unless and until you return from being lost at sea and become, come back into the living, standing on the land, then you're controlled by the Holy See, which is supposed to be the, um, the seat of sanctum, the, the holy seat, or the apostolic succession, the seat of Peter and all of that. Um, so these are things I've studied for years. I'd like to have another you know, conversation with you of the, where I've come th through uh, studying all this, seeing the symbology and the, the weaving of the web, um, the false web, because that quote that I just read is about the true web, the web of life, the web of creation, and who we really are here. And that's why I posed, keep posing the question, our responsibility and what we're here to do in re-establishing the true web of creation, the interwoven fabric of all living being and life and all of that. Um, yeah. So... The sea that we're lost in is the sea of commerce with a capital C or the letter C. And commerce is the false overlay of the bondage system and the monetary system where we all become the bondage surety to the perpetual debt system and all of that. So uh, I'll start sharing that with you. And I'm it, was, sure it was Abe Lincoln that um, freed the black slaves but, and then enslaved the whites and all of us. Well, yeah. Well, that gets into the 14th Amendment and the so-called Emancipation Proclamation. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, we don't have time for that now. But I'll, I'll send you that document, and, and I'm okay. sure it'll, it'll give you some, some um, interesting insights. Because, yeah, we've been with, with the Civil War since 1861. We've been under military occupation. And then once the third crown of the triple crown or the unum sanctum and the triregnum was established in washington dc the district of columba uh which is uh columba's latin for uh dove as is dovid which is a a mirroring of david um so all of this columbia stuff worldwide the country of columbia british columbia district of columbia um has to do with the image of the dove that people think is means peace, but it's really this false Davidic line that's been usurped. And DC created the triple crown or the third of the triple crown with the city of London, which you go into in, in the hidden King, all that detail of how they, all the markings, all the um, metrics of the um, geometry and all of that, which I found quite extraordinary. And, and it, substantiates what I've studied and come to understand for years about what the city of London is and its function with, with the Rothschild Bank and the Banking Bank of England and the law and the bar system, and the Temple Bar, which you talked about. Um, so, and that's the Triple Crown, Vatican City, City of London, DC. And DC is about the commercial system. So they put all of the original United States into a corporatized system and put it into a commercial construct and all the land and the people um, and the souls and the, the flesh were put into as the bonded surety of this false matrix of the monetary system into perpetual debt. So what we're really doing is leading the people out of being lost at sea, wrapped in that sea of commerce and the holy sea. Yeah the, the um, so forth and bringing them back to the land and rooting uh, the people and the original stewards and the new stewards back on the land to refurbish and, and rehabilitate uh, heal this world 
So that's oh, that, behind my question when I say, where do you see yourself going in, in your role and so forth? And so well, we, uh, yeah, I, think, I think that um, the way they did that in the Bible was Jesus walking on water. Right, exactly. Well, right. very, very specifically, I'll tell you exactly where to look. It's in the book of Matthew, chapter 8, verse 22, where it says, Jesus said to his disciple, uh, who said, I need to go see uh, my father who is dying. And Jesus said, let the dead tend to the dead, because the entire global system is a system of civil death. When you're in the civil body, which is a controlled uh, containment field, you're considered dead and you're acted upon as dead. So when you're going into their courts, whether it's in, in England, United States, Australia, wherever, uh, these are courts of death. They're adjudicating uh, the dead. Okay, and it goes back to Egyptian, which I go into in the, the overview document, um, uh, you know, the whole book of the dead and, and passing through the test of the, uh, the heart and the feather and all of that, which was Osiris, the god of the underworld. And um, well, Osiris, it was Anubis, and then he was changed to Osiris. Right. So there's two original Egyptian gods. Anubis and Isis, and then they've got hundreds of other names stemming from them. Right, exactly. And I'll, yeah, exactly. Um, but, um, what they did with me and the, the, the walking of the water thing is they enacted that for me, and they, they built a floating platform about mm -hmm. 170 meters from me for me to walk on water in exactly the same place that the <laughs> apostles mm -hmm. rode and where Jesus was standing, and then to land. And then there's a place that you can stand on the water and on the land at the same time. Right, okay. Right? And it's all predicted in the Bible. And then they opened it um, symbolically on my birthday. Mm -hmm. right? And then um, uh, the person who invented it, it's called a mulberry, uh, and the person who invented it is Vice Admiral Sir John Hughes Hallett, mm. as in... John, who's Hallett? Who is Hallett? <laughs> yeah, John, who is Hallett? Hey, John, who is Hallett? Yes. Yeah. And um, they, say, they, say, they say, there will be no one called John in his family and in his family history, and um, everyone will be amazed at how his name is John. So mm -hmm. what they did is they built the Mulberry floating platform, and the person who invented it was John, who's Hallett. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right? And then so back, on, back, back to Matthew 22. So he says, let the yeah. dead tend to the dead. That's describing the entire global yeah. legal monetary system and the system. Yeah, well, well point of death. Yeah. But then the next, very next um, uh, verse, they're suddenly on the Sea of Galilee on a boat. Yeah. And, and the, Jesus and the disciples are there and the boat is on the waters and a storm comes up and the waters are unsettled. Well, when you're lost at sea and submerged under the sea of commerce in debt and bonded debt uh, surety ship, um, your waters are unsettled. You have no stasis or stability. Uh, and um, so the storm comes up, the disciples go into fear they don't know how to calm their own waters of commerce, so they look to the master and say, you know, help us, and he calms the sea. So walking on water, calming the sea, letting the dead tend to the dead, it's all about how to remove oneself from the bondage, bondage of the matrix, a.k.a. the sea of commerce. Well pointed. Well done. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. so I'll send you the document. You can read it and we'll get together soon. We'll talk about that and we'll get back to where we left off. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds good. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Ken. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording.